was surprised by your yes. answers. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. How's it going Hello. today? Welcome to Grab Talk Book Club. Let us know yeah. you're here if you're here. We want to know who's in the party room with us. Who is in the room? You know what? I Oh, there's my copy. I really I thought I, I didn't pull my copy over here. Um, yeah, who's here today? We met so recently. It feels like we just did this. Right? It's been a whirlwind. How's, how's everyone doing? How are you, Mary? I'm good. It Like I said, it feels like we just did this. I feel like the last few weeks have flown by. Um, mm -hmm. you know, enjoying, enjoying summer here. It's getting very hot in Nashville, but we joined a pool. We joined the YMCA. So we've been going there, which is super fun. Hi, Carolyn. Hey, Mindy. Oh, Good to see you. Nice. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Mindy. How about you, Nicole? How are you? Yeah, I'm doing really good. I'm excited about the weekend. Things are opening up late COVID where we are. So we'll be going to the city this weekend and visiting my niece and nephew, whom I haven't seen for almost a year. It's crazy. Oh, they're going to be different great. people. They're going to look, yeah, they're gonna, depending on how old they are, they're going to look bigger, right? Yeah, yeah. they're six and nine. So oh, they're totally going to look bigger. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited. Who else is cool. in the room Hi. with us? Yay! Yay, friends. I've been wondering yeah. if we'd get a large turnout yeah. last last Friday in June or if it might be a smaller group because people are getting outside and doing other things at this time of year. But we're so glad for everyone who's here joining us. Yeah, on that note, should yeah. we maybe let's, let's ask a couple icebreaker questions. Yeah, that sounds good. So you know what I'm up to this weekend. What's everyone else up to this weekend? What are you doing, Mary? We're going to go to the pool. So there's a local YMCA okay. that we joined that has, um, that's really fun. It has like the fancy slides that go into the pool and, um, and a, like a really fun pool for, for very small people because my son's three, so mm -hmm. he can't swim yet. So we're going to, we're going to head there tomorrow because he loved it last weekend when we went. So that's really, that's one on our agenda. That's so what are fun. other people doing? Okay. Um, I just want to tell you, <laughs> when we plan to go into the city, I'm like, what is something we don't do here on the Sunshine Coast? Go to Red Robin. There's no Red Robin. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do for lunch tomorrow. I'm like, what it's is ridiculously Red Robin? Crazy. You don't have Red Robin? I don't think so. It's a what burger is it? Place. I've, been, I've been to some in the States. It's a burger place. Yeah, okay. I don't know. It's well, for me. I don't know that we have it. I don't know that we have it in the South. Do other people know if we have mm -hmm. it in the South? I just missed it. Is it like fast food? It's not. It's a it's a bona fide restaurant, but okay. it's like yeah, all kinds of burgers, gourmet burgers, and nice milkshakes. What are other people kind of doing? What are you all doing this weekend? Let us know. Red Robin has great burgers. Where are you, Mindy? Where are you living? Are you also in the Pacific Northwest? Okay, another thing we want to hear. Oh, it's in Long mm. Island. It's like a, oh, Fridays. Thank you, Elizabeth. That puts it in perspective uh, for me. Okay. Do you have TGI Fridays? Okay. We, I... Yes, I think we okay. do. Yeah. I don't know if Vancouver has one, but. Ah, Mindy's in California. Oh, so she's Yay. West Coast too. And Morgan has one in Texas. Ha ha. So mm. what's on people's to read? What are, what are on your summer reading lists? Let's get those. I'd love to hear too. What are people excited about reading? either on vacation or just in your yard or on your porch or in your bed. Um, I can share. Let me see. What is on my list? <laughs> um, I'm reading a novel. It's across the room, but it's called The Plot. And it came, a friend of mine recommended it. And I'm really excited. I'm starting it. I was trying to start it last night, but then I got busy. So I'm going to start it tonight. Uh, what about you, Nicole? <laughs> I'm going to read your book. <laughs> I'm waiting for it to Yay. come. For sure. <laughs> I, are you like me and you have like a, st like a stack of books that are just ongoing, yeah. like a long, long, I have white rage and I haven't started it yet. I don't know if it's beach reading, but I, I definitely need to read it. Yeah. It's on my shelf. I, 
I have that stack too of like books I've read anywhere from five pages to like 200 pages and I just need to pick them back up. I've got that stack mm. too. I love the um, idea of audio. This is something Mindy that I also am planning to get into. I love the idea of going for like walks and in the car, that kind of thing. Yeah. I need to get more into it. I'm a member of audible and I just have these credits stacking up. Um, finding a mother tree. Okay. A year of living kindly just finished mm. huddle by Brooke Baldwin and the summer book by, T Oh, great. Morgan. Ooh. Is the summer book a Moomin book by Tova Jansen or is it a different, different series? I love Tova Jansen stuff. I think that's her name who did the Moomin troll. Moomin I've troll never books? read, I've never read her books. Hmm. Yeah, they're lovely. Oh, oh okay. that's Overdrive. great, Mindy. Check mm -hmm. out Overdrive. Ah, okay. Carolyn's Reading Library Books, Stegner a Stegner's Angle of Repose, Virginia Woolf's A Writer's Diary. Oh, that, that'll that be good. And Danny Shapiro's Hourglass. Great. Great. Cool. Oh, love them. We've got more Moomin lovers here. Yay. <laughs> Different series. Okay, cool. Oh, that's great, Liz. So you're listening to a book on your phone while you're cleaning and putting stuff away. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, awesome. I listen to podcasts that way. I need to get more into audiobooks, though. I think I would enjoy those even more than podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay. Should we kind of kick it off here? Let's kick it off here. So if, if someone is just joining us for the first time, Mary and I started Craft Talk Book Club earlier this year. This is our sixth, seventh, 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 is that right? Yeah. Seventh. <laughs> and we do this because we love, we are, our jam is, is learning about craft and helping other writers learn about craft. So we figure a great way to do that is by observing what's working in the books that we love. And so we're delighted to have you here to talk about today's book. Uh, I'm going to introduce Mary, and we'll go from there. Mary Adkins is the author of the novels When You Read This, an indie next pick, and best book of 2019 by Good Housekeeping, and Privilege, New York Post best book of the week, and Today.com best summer read. Her books have been published in 13 countries, and her next novel, Palm Beach, will be published by HarperCollins this summer. Pre-orders are available now. Her essays and reporting have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, State, and more. She teaches storytelling for the moth worldwide and creative writing online and in her home of Nashville. That Nashville. Oh, my gosh. I'm tripping over my words. <laughs> hey. I'm so excited. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Um, and I'll introduce Nicole now. Nicole Bright is an award-winning essayist, poet, and writing instructor based in Canada's Sunshine Coast. Her work is widely published in print and online journals, and her essay, An Atmospheric Pressure, was selected as a notable essay by the editors of Best American Essays 2017. She's the creator of Spark Your Story, a series of online programs for life writers that help, help writers get experimental with structure and master the foundations of story craft. So, how do you, what do you want to? What do we always start with, Nicole? Let's start with a quote. Let's do. Let me pull it up. Okay, so we always start with a quote from the book, and the quote that we're going to start with today is short and sweet. You must learn to live on fault lines. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. I chose this quote because I thought it was so perfect for this book, which is really about that being in a precarious place between two worlds and sort of learning to live um, with danger and uncertainty, um, the line between past and present and the line between illness and wellness. Um, and I really thought this, this book was an incredible journey. And one of the things that I admired so much about it was when I imagined how difficult it would have been to, to relive all of those hard experiences in, in the first part of the book. And when I imagine what it must have taken to, to go there, I thought, wow, like she, she did an amazing job of doing that. Um, and I tuned into an interview with Saleka Jawad with Liz Gilbert, and she had talked about feeling a lot of resistance about writing about this experience at first. 
which she understood as a symptom of needing to write it, which I think is really interesting um, for writers of memoir and creative nonfiction, that it's that place you don't want to go, which is pointing you right to the place where you should go. And um, she said she was afraid to do it, but when she started actually writing that first part about her time, first getting her diagnosis and going through the first paces of treatment, it started to really pour out of her. Um, the challenge was shifting and being able to write out of illness. And that was also the, the challenge of living after being ill. So I've been thinking about this and I wonder if anyone else felt this way, that it was really kind of like an odyssey or an epic journey. Um, and to that end, Mary and I were talking a little bit about the hero's journey, which the author mentions, I think, in the latter part of the book, and how that might apply to the structure and the telling of this story. So I, I'm really curious and excited to hear what you think about that, Mary, and how it applies to this story. Yeah, yeah, I would love to talk about that. I think it's so can I just want to not leave what you just said real fast, though, because I think that's so interesting to me as someone who, I mean, I write primarily fiction. Um, and I think because there is, when I, when I do kind of dabble in nonfiction or memoir, it is scary in a way that fiction isn't. And so I'm fascinated by that idea that like what you're resistant to writing may be a sign that that's what you, where you need to go or where need is a weird word to use, right? Like maybe not That's need, but like- Yeah, your writing is tr trying to tell you to go almost. Yeah, like that's where the richness is and that's where there's something to be found and mined. And um, I'd love to hear, do others relate to that experience? Have people found that to be true? The people here who write who write nonfiction? Is that a familiar sensation to you? Is it familiar to you, Nicole? Yeah, I often feel that when I'm resisting something, it's because there's something coming up from the surface that maybe I'm not comfortable with yet. Like I haven't, it's very to go there, but I think that is kind of the often the clue to where your story needs to go or the way out of your story. And I talk this in, about this in my teaching. What's interesting as we're talking is that um, I know that Joseph Campbell speaks about this. And of course, Joseph Campbell um, has, I think his book is called The Hero's Journey. One of his books is called The Hero's Journey, yeah. but it's about resistance being um, a, a part of the psyche that like isn't integrated yet. And so it's scary. But, you know, like the subconscious is sort of like aware of it. And as and I think as applying it to writing, that's exactly it, is that liberation and freedom comes through addressing the thing that you're resisting. Yeah. That's where you need to go. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm not seeing anything quite yet in the chat. Oh, there we go. The Carolyn says absolutely almost all of my good writing starts with something I'm struggling with or afraid to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fear is yeah. the common denominator, I think, when, you know, fiction, nonfiction. Yeah, you know, writing, writing, honestly, writing from the heart, telling the stories Thanks, we most Mindy. need to tell. Yeah, the mm, hero the with hero a thousand faces. Yeah, that's right. Great. So Thank yeah, you. I would love to just open it up for a second to, to get to the hero's journey. Like what, when you think of the hero's journey, what do you think of? And just feel free to share in the chat. And if you don't know, you're like, I don't re really know what that is. I've heard it said, but I don't know what it is. You know, you can let us know that too. I mean, I think it's become, it's kind of taken on a, a life of its own. There are different definitions of it. Um, if you read the book, she does bring it up at one point. Let me see. I flagged where it is. She brings it up on page 211. Mm -hmm. The hero's journey is one of the oldest narratives in literature. Mm 
when I think of the hero's journey, and I think this is maybe from Joseph Campbell, I think of Star Wars, because I think that's one of the examples of those elements that are common in the hero's journey. Does that, did you, have you ever heard that one, Mary? Is that familiar? That, I think um, so, yeah. It's like a classic example of it. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mindy says, I usually think of Christopher Vogler's version used in film, which is based on Campbell's work, 12, 12 stages. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to kind of read how she defines it here on 211. So she says, the hero's journey is one of the oldest narratives in literature. Survivors like heroes have faced mortal danger and undergone impossible trials. Against all odds, they persevere, becoming better, braver for their battle scars. Once victory has been secured, they return to the ordinary world, transformed with a crude wisdom and a renewed appreciation for life. And then she goes on in her case to say for the past um, few years, I've been bombarded with this narrative, observing it in movies and books. Um, fundraising campaigns and get well cards. It's hard not to traffic in such cliches when they've become so culturally embedded. Basically, she goes on to say, I make attempts to inhabit the narrative to return to living as triumphantly as I can, right? And then she talks about going to the gym, buying a juicer, going to the coffee shop and trying to write. Um, trying to be better as a form of embodying the hero's journey. And it's so, it was really interesting for me reading that part because I think um, I also talk a lot about um, journey character arc in, in my teaching because I really work with people who are working on long form narrative work. So novels and memoirs. Um, but really we talk a lot about like a long form narrative, which typically is a version of a hero's journey. Like it's a, it's a series of events that leads to a change in perspective. And I think there's a, there's a sort of common initial understanding of a hero of the hero's journey or a hero's journey that is similar to what she's describing in this moment, which is that it's external, which is that it's primarily external. So it's like, you know, you're fighting dragons and you're, <laughs> you're, you know, you're going on this journey, this quest, and then like through, through overcoming these obstacles, like you emerge triumphant. And I know that even when it's true that there's like an external journey like that, whether it's in Disney or, you know, classic literature or contemporary story that we might read, like the external is largely meant as a, as a metaphor often for what's going on internally. But I think as writers, what's helpful can be not, not to think of the, like any kind of journey. Um, sometimes I hesitate to say the hero's journey because it sounds so individualistic, but like the journey of any given character, the, the, the sort of psychological emotional journey as being an external one and thinking of it more as something a lot more subtle, which is just a shift in perspective and like what it takes to get to a shift in perspective. And sometimes it can take something monumental and sometimes it can take something small, but ultimately that's all it is. It's actually quite a simple thing. It's just a sh the slightest, it's just a shift in perspective. And in this book, you know, I'm seeing her try to do all of these things. And it's, it was such a good illustration. It was so meta, right? She's talking about the hero's journey. But in talking about trying to live up to the hero's journey, she was exhibiting like the first early part of the hero's journey where she doesn't yet understand. <laughs> like she's not exhibiting understanding of what it actually is, because what it actually is, is not showing up at coffee shops and writing or drinking green smoothies or exercising, it's just shift in her perspective. Like that's what she needs to get to. And um, we're ultimately, you know, it's going to be through doing all of this stuff and, and failing to find that shift in perspective that leads her to the thing that does grant her the shift in perspective, which is, I mean, I, I, I found that to be returning to the, um, the conversation she was having when she was sick, like being willing to go back there and talk to these people 
who were part of her life when she was sick and in a way facing her sickness, like she turned around and looked it in the face again, instead of just trying to run from it Mm -hmm. was kind of how I was thinking about it. How are you think, how are you kind of seeing her hero's journey? Nicole? Yeah. I don't know if I, if I had one clear um, shift in perspective, perspective, but I I think in her conversations with people on the second part of the book as she's road tripping, I think feel like she's taking perspectives from everyone that she meets and trying to sort of integrate um, how she's going to do this, this feat for her, which is figuring out how to reintegrate into life and what she's going to do with her new relationship and all that stuff. Um, But one of the key takeaways that I, I took was, and I can't remember who it is that she's she's speaking with, but they have a conversation about travel. And when we travel, we actually take three trips. There's the first of preparation and anticipation, packing and daydreaming. There's the trip you're actually on. And then there's the trip you remember. The key is to try to keep all three as separate as possible, he says. The key is to be present wherever you are right now. This advice more than any stays with me. So I feel like there's a a, a clue to how to um, treat the past and live well by being in the present. And maybe yeah. that's a, a that she she brings with her. That's really, yeah, yeah. I like that, and I think um, yeah, that was a beautiful part. I think. One thing that that Nicole and I have talked about that we both really loved about this book, and I want to hear if you're willing to share in the chat, what did you what did you really love about this book? Like, what did you think she did really well? Um, we loved how she brought to life the characters who are not herself, like the the people that she's coming into contact with. They felt they felt really alive to me, and I'm you know from her from both of her parents. I thought her parents were really like clearly rendered to her friend, Melissa, who she met in the Mm -hmm. hospital. Um, Will, of course, who was her boyfriend. Yeah, I mean, he's beautifully drawn. And what what do other people, what what did you love about this book? And what did you think about what she did well? I see Mindy says, return with the elixir. I think that's the shift in perspective. I'd love to hear Uh, a little bit more on that. That sounds, that sounds very aligned with the hero's journey, returning with the mm-hmm. elixir. Mm-hmm. How, how did you feel about this book, friends? Like, did you like it? Was it okay? Did you love it? Uh, I actually heard from Amanda who couldn't join us today and she emailed me to say, what did she say? She felt like the journey through her illness was recounted a bit like a reporter but the writing was so compelling. I sailed through it. Mm. I'd love to hear what, how other people felt about, about this one. Yeah, me too. Please share your, your thoughts on reading. Um, I think I, I expected I think I expected more of the book itself to be about life after sickness. Um, And a lot more of it was devoted to the the illness side of the two kingdoms than I, than I expected, which was interesting given what you told me about um, what she said in the interview, Nicole, about not wanting to write that part and then it becoming really the bulk of the the book. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that context is really needed in order to enjoy and and appreciate the decision she makes to do this road trip. I, I think it was in the same interview. I, I didn't get to watch it a second time to confirm. But I think she said that initially that resistance meant she really didn't want to write that, that first part of the journey at all and just focus on the road trip, which was you know, she's finally cancer free, she's free to go figure out how she's going to live in the world again. But she realized in the writing that she couldn't not write that first part about getting the diagnosis and, and all of that stuff, which contextualizes and really helps us as readers understand 
you know, where she's going when she, when she embarks on that part of the literal journey, the travel. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting to think about what this book, maybe if we all took a second just to imagine what this book would be like if she had only told the journey part, the literary, I mean, the literal journey part, um, if that's what she focused on and then told the earlier, you know, all the stuff about the illness through flashbacks, like, it'd be a really, be a very different reading experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Campbell says, if there's no elixir, the hero is destined to repeat the journey like in Groundhog's Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Mindy. Mm -hmm. Yay. Liz found the writing very compelling and clear and concise. Yeah, I think she does have a reporter's eye. And one of the things that I really love, too, was... Um, her knack for description, like of place particularly. Um, I'd love to see, you know, what what any of your favorite um, quotes were from the piece. I'll, I'll just share mine. Um, from It's from The Value of Pain, page 283, when she's road tripping. Somewhere between South Dakota and Wyoming, the fall chill turns to killing frost and the trees empty of birds. I roll down a window and stick a hand out and my fingers quickly go numb. A wet chalky scent fills the air. It starts to snow, a flake falling here, a flake falling there, and my mind begins to wander. As I travel the land in between, it feels at times as though all I am is memory. I rewind old scenes from my life seeing countless mistakes and regrettable choices, unable to do anything about them now, except better understand what happened. I just love the use of the senses there with the wet chalky scent and um, the fingers going numb in the cold and the, the chill turning to killing frost. It's just mm -hmm. really pretty and brings us right there. I love that too. I think I, that reminds me, a moment I think I loved was a little earlier. I'm not sure exactly where, but, you know, I think it speaks to like these small moments that can be so, um, they can be so vivid and memorable when she's leaving on her road. Well, she's already started her road trip, but she goes to see her parents, goes by her parents' house and her dad throws water on the back of the car which is apparently a mm -hmm. Tunisian tradition to like throw mm -hmm. water behind someone as they leave to wish them safety on their journey um I loved that detail mm -hmm. I also love this is not a descriptive line but I really liked this line um like it made me I don't know. It made me think. And I, I appreciated that to tell, this is page 337 to tell stories about your life is to refuse to be reduced to flat inevitability. Mm -hmm. um, I think the inevitability is the surprising word for me in that sentence. Um, like I see it as, you know, I see how storytelling would be to, to refuse to be reduced to flatness, but like to refuse to be reduced to flat inevitability is like really surprising spin there at the end as if mm -hmm. um, telling stories about your life kind of creates uh, almost like creates a new trajectory for it or, or creates a sort of pathway of causes that isn't there if you don't tell the story. I don't know. There's just something really kind of cool mm -hmm. that feels a little bit magical about that to me, that mm -hmm. line. Carolyn says she has this yeah. quote posted on a sticky note above her desk. If you want to write a good book, write what you don't want others to know. If you want to write a great book, write what you don't want to know about yourself. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I think one of the things too, that we need to always remember about narrators, which is can be difficult in vulnerable writing nonfiction or memoir, particularly is that we're flawed. And we have to write our flaws and the things we don't, we're not proud of in order to create a true persona, a true likeness of ourselves, and to be relatable and to be human, fully human. Do you think she does that in this book? 
Yeah. I would love to hear if people think she does that. I think she does that. Like I didn't, I definitely wasn't always charmed by her in this book. I was engaged and I found the story compelling, but there were certainly times when I found myself irritated with her as a character, which maybe speaks to the, how well she's doing what we're talking about. Like she's revealing these parts of herself that, you know, aren't always necessarily the most likable. Mm -hmm. The things we don't say out loud usually, right? About what we're thinking yeah. and yeah, how we're really feeling about things. And I, I thought it was really kind of cute and endearing that she kept coming back to her being a terrible driver. I just thought that was really funny. <laughs> a little bit of lightness in a in a heavy, you know, a heavy story. Even when we're yeah, well, in, in part two, and we're, you know, we're supposed to be feeling lifted, you know, things are getting better. Yeah. What does she say? She says, like, it would have taken a better driver, you know, not not nearly as long. But for me, it took it took forever. <laughs> Exactly. Does anyone have a favorite quote or something they would like to share that they would borrow or steal from this book? Mm. Oh, that's interesting, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Great. I loved where she was talking about her relationship with Will and how she'd failed him. I was glad to hear that because I'd been irritated by her attitude toward Will, her expectations of him. Of him. Yeah, I mean, there's a real story of loss there too. Like the timing of them coming together and then him being with her through this just in, incredibly difficult, frightening journey and being with her the whole time. It was... Yeah, it was, he was an admirable character. And I, I think sometimes after a breakup, that can be really hard to get on the page, but I really felt she wrote him with love, even when, even, you know, knowing, knowing as we do later in the book that it, it doesn't last, that it falls apart. Yeah. And she does, she does admit to her failings in, in how things right. go wrong. And yeah, you know, an she was, Oh, sorry. It, it was a, what an impossible situation. You said not impossible situation to expect two really young people to yeah. figure out how. I mean, to to last as as long right. as it did. I think, given that they were only like three weeks in a relationship, something like that. It was very early, or no, it was three weeks that he came. Was that no? I can't remember. No, he came to be with her very early, and then she gets the diagnosis not long after her. Right. After that. And they're so young, right? I mean, like they're thrust into this very dire situation and they're in their, she's in her early twenties. Like she's just out of college. I was such an idiot at that age. I mean, like I can't, I cannot imagine having to show emotional maturity at that age around this mm -hmm. kind of, you know, this kind of crisis. Um, mm -hmm. I was gonna say something about that too. You said, Oh, how cringy. Oh my gosh. I was so uncomfortable when they went to couples therapy and they had to be in a room with a whole bunch of people staring at them and asking mm. them questions. I felt mm. the discomfort there. Like, get out of that room. Mm. That sounds awful. Yeah. Mm. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is tense in this book. Did did you notice um what did what did you notice about tense? What what tense is this book written in? We have a we have a like a 10 second delay so when we get silent we're just waiting for people to hear us hear us and answer mm -hmm. us. Did people notice the tent, the the tense that she chose? Mm. <laughs> maybe maybe everyone at twenty two is an idiot. Like, what can yeah. you know at twenty? What can you know? Right, right. I think most memoirs are written in past tense, and that, that's sort of what I expect from a long form memoir with reflective voice and being able to look back at who you were then, now that you are somebody else, you've gone through a change because you've been through the experience you're writing about. 
Okay, Carolyn, I was so intrigued that she wrote the first part in past and the second part in present. Did you notice where that switch happened? I, I was intrigued by it too, and I find it really permission giving, which I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Liz says, I noticed that she uses a lot of ING verbs where I maybe would not have, but I don't have the book in front of me. Okay. Hmm, yeah, so, the, so this book is really written in two parts. And in that interview with Liz Gilbert, she described it as a symphony in two movements, which I thought is such a lovely, elegant way to describe this book and the way that it's structured. Um, so part two is when we, is called The In-Between Place chapter 25 and it begins or it, it cont continues past tense up until kind of the end of a paragraph paragraph three and then easing into paragraph four so it's not a neat beginning in the new tense as you start it's sort you're sort of like transitioned into it which makes it almost imperceptible mm. I thought that was really artfully done and interesting so she's talking about how in cancer wards, my book, it's page 200, that there's a bell that patients ring on their last day of treatment, signaling the transition. And then she writes, it's time to say goodbye to the eerie and changeless fluorescence of hospital rooms. It's time to step back into sunlight. That's the end of the paragraph. And then the next paragraph begins with, it is where I find myself now on the threshold between an old familiar state and an unknown future. Cancer mm. no longer lives in my blood, but it lives on in other ways, dominating my identity, my relationships, my work, and my thoughts. I thought that was so interesting how you can almost miss it. Uh, I almost did. And um, I'd like to know what you think the effect of uh, is of writing past tense for the first part of the book and then switching to present as a reader and in, in the way that the story is told. How do you feel about um, past tense and present tense? How do they differ in terms of um, how it feels to read a story that's in I hope that's that does that make sense? Did I articulate that well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hadn't noticed that transition. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. It's really, that is really elegant. Uh, my, I think my, if I had the brilliant idea that I was going to switch tenses in between, I would begin the new section that way, like a clean yeah. way, but it actually is way more effective as we're talking about a transition into a new life and being in an in-between place, particularly to do that sneaky, almost sneaky easing in to the new yeah. tense. Yeah. And I think, I mean, maybe one way to frame this question too is while we're waiting on people to chime in with thoughts is like, what is the, when you read something in present tense, what, how, did, how is that experience different from reading it in past tense? Mm -hmm. um, for me, like, there's, I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but like it has a, an immediacy to it. Like it feels kind of ongoing, like it's happening closer to real time than past tense does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carolyn says mm. the first part was traumatic enough in past tense and the shift to present tense helped the less traumatic, dramatic part come alive mm. more. I love exactly that, that there is a, an aliveness and an immediacy and a closeness to present tense. And I think you're right, it would have actually been traumatic to bring her readers in and probably to write it in present. I think past tense was a really mm. good craft choice, but also as a writer, I think as self-care, it was probably better to write it in past tense where there's some mm. distance. It happened before, I'm not in it anymore. Yeah. Um, and as a, you know, as a writer of memoir and creative nonfiction, I think this is a really great tool or technique to use for, for that reason. How about if we're writing the hard stuff, we make it easier for our readers by doing it in past tense. And when we write about that transformation,
transformation or that change or that reemergence. That's that's what she's doing. She's reemerging. She's literally road tripping. You're on it with her in present tense, which is close and immediate and easier, you know, easier to come along with. I wanted to road trip with her, but I didn't want to actually experience what she experienced. Mm -hmm. It was it was hard enough just to read it with some distance from past tense. That's really cool, Nicole. Sometimes I, um, it makes me think of like sometimes in my, in my course community, we'll talk about like someone will say something like, you know, I, like I'm writing this intense kind of plot line or tension. And, and sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm running away from it because I'll start writing this like side subplot that's like more fun for me. And I don't mm -hmm. want to run away from the main thing. And sometimes we'll talk about how like, but, but maybe for the same reason that you need a break from that intense tension, like maybe the reader does too. Like maybe you needing like a minute mm -hmm. to experience this more mm -hmm. fun thing. You're, you're also giving the reader a palate cleanser. Like, and it, that that's it's mm -hmm. cool to think of sometimes when we step back like to think of our own needs as a writer be as writers being being in sync with readers needs and so if we're attuned to mm -hmm. yeah I like I feel better writing this in past tense that means it could also feel better to read it in past tense mm -hmm. exactly Carolyn says, I think the present tense underscored that she is still living the journey of the in-between in some ways it isn't over and done. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It feels just right. And I love the idea even for short form work that shifting, shifting maybe halfway or three quarters of the way through a piece that's in past tense into present is another way of emphasizing that moment of change of that transformation mm -hmm. that we're writing to which is like yeah. the really simplified hero's journey that we're talking about. What's the shift? What's the internal change? What's the new perspective? I think that's a really cool technique that I'm going to try, even in like a micro piece. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be really cool. That's what I'm going to take away. I, I love that. I really love that. Yeah, everyone's going to do it. It's very unique right now. <laughs> Everyone's going to be doing it in their nonfiction memoir now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a quote here I just wanted to share about this this um, experience of writing it in past tense and then and then shifting. Um, she says, I kept trying to write it in past tense and it wasn't working. It sounded stilted and distant. And it wasn't until I realized that I was allowed to switch halfway through the book from past tense to present that the road trip and this healing portion of the book cracked open for me. So it was hard to write wow. it. She couldn't write it all in past tense. And I guess that's just the kind of thing that as we're in the process of writing, you know, you can't know until you're in it, what's going to work. And when that moment of cracking open will happen, you just have to keep going, but it helps to know right. to observe what other writers do and have that toolkit of ideas. Yeah. If you're stuck. Yeah, absolutely. So I promised we'd do a little bit of writing today. And Carolyn, you've already done this with me. <laughs> Hope you don't mind uh, following along again. But since we're talking about playing with tenses and how, how this can help us with our work, I thought I would share with you a prompt. I recently did a retreat with Brenda Miller, who is just such a brilliant instructor of creative nonfiction and a beautiful writer herself. So are you guys up for that? Are you up for like doing a little bit of writing and starting a story today and getting a little playful with um, with working in different tenses? Please say yes. I am. Happy to do that. It's a great exercise. Great. So given that we're close to the... Um, to the hour being up, I think we'll just do like three minutes per per prompt. And then we'll talk a little bit about what happened in the process. Great. Yeah, that's cool that the story informed the tense. Yeah, I agree. Okay, Robin's in. Yay. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to find an object. Doesn't have to don't think too hard about it, just something around you that you can observe or pick up and and that will be our, our entry point, our way into doing some storytelling. So I'll just give you a minute to find something in your vicinity. Uh, it's June, but I have my Christmas, um, 
<laughs> my Christmas coffee mug here, just because it was the biggest one I could find. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you have it, I'm going to ask you to write a little bit, free write about it for yeah, about three minutes. And you can start with just to find your way in, I'm sitting here on a Friday morning or afternoon, depending where you are, and my eyes light upon your object. And I want you to stay in the present tense and include the senses as you write. The way that um, Salika Jawad did in her book when she was, that passage that I read you, she was talking about how her fingers felt. She was talking about what she saw and what she smelled. Let's keep, keep the senses engaged as you're writing. Okay. And I'll I'll stop you in about three minutes. One more minute and then I'll bring you back. All right, writers, wherever you are is perfect. I'm going to ask you to slowly come back and begin a new paragraph that you're going to write in the past tense. You're going to write about any memories that you have about this object that you've been writing about or memories the object evokes, any associations, the history of it. Doesn't have to be a memory necessarily, just even a feeling or idea the object has sparked in you.
maybe 30 more seconds. And start to slowly ease your way out and come back. All right, writers. So your third and last paragraph, you're going to time travel into the future. Start with years from now, I imagine. And you can write about the object, where it will be, a different object, where you will be. Maybe years from now, I imagine I will. Years from now, I imagine I want. Or years from now, I imagine I'll remember. Let's see where it takes you. Just a few more, maybe 15, 20 more seconds to wrap up, and then we'll come back. All right, everyone. How did that go? What did you write about? First of all, I'm so curious what people decided to use as an object to get started. Bye, Liz. Thanks, Liz, for joining us. So glad to have you here. Yeah, what did people use? I used just a pair of eyeglasses, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't end up writing about them at all. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to hear what people chose. Mm -hmm. And how it went. And do you feel like you might have a start here of something you'd like to develop? Were you surprised by what came up? Um, how did it go? I had an interesting experience with the second exercise because I wanted to, I was writing about something in the past tense that mm -hmm. um, is a feeling that I now recognize, like I, I recognize I actually don't want to be in the past tense. I want to bring, I want that feeling to be back with me now. 
And so mm -hmm. my tense drifted back into the present without me realizing it until oh. I looked back. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. That happened to another writer when I did this in one of my groups that she stayed in the past. Yeah, she wanted to, to stay in the past. Mm -hmm. But it to me, it doesn't matter. I think I think a story prompts get you started and your story is going to take you where it wants to go. Yeah. Mindy wrote about the hourglass that you use to monitor writing time. I love, I love that Mindy? you use an hourglass, I, Mindy. Yeah, I've always been really fast. Like, even as a kid, I always loved hourglasses. They, like, seem a little magical. They're so cool and magical, yeah. Right? My dog's medicine, Vetmedin, is not available, so I wrote about getting her med compounded while we were on vacation. Great. Carolyn wrote about a Bible that I gave to my grandmother for Christmas about 10 days before she died. Aww. Oh, cool. And then do you do How fiction? Was it to write? Mm. Oh, great. How was it to write about, about these objects? Just let's just to, for a couple, just a little longer. And then we'll, we're getting so close to the hour. We want to talk about some other things too. Yeah. We have some news to share. News and updates. The first time I did this exercise, I wrote about an old sugar skull, um, like Day of the Dead sugar skull that I had. It was a sticker that used to be in my kid's bedroom, but I didn't want to get rid of it when we moved here. So I had it on my office wall and it took me to how I've I've always wanted to go to a Day of the Dead celebration in Mexico. And it started me thinking, maybe I need to plan that now that we can travel. Got me all excited. <laughs> cool. Oh my gosh, amazing. Well, should we should we make our make our announcements before people have to run? Yeah, absolutely. We have some book news. We go ahead, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you stop talking? Because I thought you were going to say thing. something. I was going to like burst, but I'm like, I don't want to steal Mary's thunder. Mary, you go ahead. Oh no. We both have books coming out. Yay. Um, mine is coming out in August and Nicole's is coming out in September. So um, we are going to take July off for Craft Talk Book Club. And then at the end of August, we will meet to discuss Palm Beach. And since I wrote it, you can ask me any questions you have about the craft. Um, <laughs> and then in September... Nicole has an essay and a craft book coming out, which is very on topic for Craft Talk Book Club. So we will talk about that book, specifically Nicole's essay in it and her craft, um, her craft lessons in that essay. So I, this is going to be so fun to like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of blend, blend book club with, um, with the things the that we actually we do in the yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. So we won't be meeting in July, but we'll send out a reminder email in August. Um, my, um, you've probably seen my announcements. My novel is Palm Beach, and you will have had almost a whole month to read it by the time we meet to discuss it. And your book is called what, Nicole? Getting to the Truth, the Craft and Practice of Creative Nonfiction. It has more than 20 essays from different writers. Some of my favorites, Randon Billings, Nobles in it, Beth Kephart. Melanie Brooks um, and mine is on the visual essay so we'll talk visual essays when we meet in September and I think if I can quickly share my screen I might be able to show you the cover oh please savvy do person. I'm gonna tell me, tell me if it works tell me if it works is it are you can you see my screen can you see it I don't yet yes. I do not yet see it but it might just be, mm. there might just be a okay. lag. Let's try now. Oh yeah, it's working, it's loading. And thank you for those of you saying, saying, okay. uh, saying congratulations. It's, a... it's so cute. Mm -hmm. I love the cover. Yeah, it's super cute. Okay, great. I'm glad you can see it. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Now I'm feeling all bashful. <laughs> No, it's great. It's an adorable cover. I'm I'm very Yay, excited. So, Yay. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. It's always good to see all of you. And thanks so much for another great discussion. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everyone. Yay, Robin. I saw that you pre-ordered it. Thank you.
um, and see you both or see you all um, in August, if not before, add something else. Bye. Sounds Have good. a great summer. Bye. Safe travels.